Hey, welcome back to Open Game. This is episode 12. We've got Victor Ochoa in the house. I want to thank you first, bro, for uh, giving us your time and your experience and, and just sharing your wisdom with us, bro. Really appreciate you. Everything that you've done, not only for the community, but worldwide. Welcome to the show. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you very much, man. Yes, sir. What's up, Victor? How are you doing today? Very good, man. Very good. Perfect weather and here in San Diego. Uh, ready to ready to do stuff outside, even go to the pool too. I'm, I'm doing my water aerobics now. I'm back on <laughs> back again since the pandemic, man. So you you were a muralist, uh, you're a grandfather, a father, um, you were an activist, you're a community elder. Um, there's so many things that you've done that you're you're a professor in the college level, you're a teacher. Um, I believe you're a speaker in some points. Um, let's get into some of that stuff. We talked earlier about your stance, whether it be political or, or you know, community-based. I believe you were born in Los Angeles, correct? Right. Born in uh, right after World War II. Uh, my parents uh, decided to, to come to the United States uh, undocumented and uh, to to hatch me over here on this side of the border, <laughs> which I think is, is something that a lot of, a lot of people do. And, uh, but then, then I got kicked out back to Mexico during 1955, Operation Wetback, and um, uh, got the great opportunity to raise up a, a little bit in Mexico as well. In LA, what was, uh, what was your lifestyle like at that, that early time? Were you an activist already? Were you um, seeing a lot of that in your community? What was happening with you? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, I got kicked out when I was seven. So the, you know, I would, you know, as far as being an activist stuff, you know, I'm not sure exactly. I know that my parents were afraid of us to, to speak Spanish mm. uh, because immigration in those days, Immigration looked like the G-men. You know, they had uh, London fogs, big hats, big 45 stuck in their side. And they were pretty scary. My mom was like really frightening, uh, frightened of those guys. So, um, you know, I think uh, there, uh, it was pretty much a, a life of being kind of like undercover mm. and, uh, and uh, stressed out. My my mom my dad was it was funny because he had uh, always had false uh, IDs and when I first heard his name it, his name was Percy Valenzuela and I go mom I, I thought his my dad was Victor Ochoa like me and uh, and he said Shh, don't, don't don't you know you know don't keep 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 a low low <laughs> and it was. You know, his name is his ID was Presiliano Valenzuela. You know, and uh, in fact, uh, later on when my dad died, uh, my mom did receive some of his working benefits, uh, mm -hmm. even with that false name, because we we still kept his his false IDs. You know, it's one of those things that that you live in in a place you know like LA, but you're and you're Mexican, but you're still you still don't feel like you belong. And it's, and it's uh, I still kind of feel like a lot of people, you know, we have this term arrimado. It's like when you live in somebody else's house, it's a really terrible feeling. I, I've experienced that where, oh, like if you're going to get the cornflakes and you use all the milk, man, everybody else, every, everybody in their house gets, <laughs> gets ticked off at you, man. It's like, especially if you like to eat like me, man. It's like, oh, man. Now, that's mm -hmm. been tough, tough times. In fact, I, I got my first apartment when I was like 16. Okay. Couldn't take were, that. Were you in Mexico still at the time when, when that happened? No, it was, it, I, I live with, uh, with different people trying to get back to school because I love school. I always loved school since I was a kid. And when I graduated from sixth grade in Tijuana, I wanted to continue my education and it was like, you know, I got like straight A's. I was like number one kid in the, in the graduation. And uh, so I, 
but my parents, they, they weren't making very much money. I think they were making like 20 bucks a week. Um, um, eat both of them um, in Tijuana. So that, that really, that really couldn't uh, support me uh, coming back to the United States, you know, and uh, so I had to live in people's garages and people's, uh, you know, front rooms and, and it's, it was, it was pretty terrible time for me. I, you know, I, I try to survive. I, I think that going to school was the most important thing for me. What year was it that you came back to the States and was that uh, from Mexico to San Diego? No, it was Mexico from Tijuana to, to LA, back to East LA. Okay. And, um, what year was so, that? Well, I, I got taken out on, in 55 and then I, then I stayed like seven, seven years, I think it was. And then, cause I had to start first grade again. I didn't, I didn't speak Spanish. I had to learn, I had to learn English, uh, I kind of, oh, I had to learn to learn Spanish first, which I didn't know any, any Spanish. And then when I came back, my English was like, uh, you know, first grade, you know, it was like, right, really, right. and so I, you know, it, it, that was, a, that was a kind of a tough time for me. So you're back in Los Angeles again, what, were you starting to see things happening in the community? Uh, you know, activism at that point, um, getting involved. You're probably like around 15 then. Well, you know, that, that was for sure because uh, I think that's where my Chicano attitude developed because uh, I came back, I, I knew about Mexican history and I, I, I felt like a Mexican. Hmm. But, you know, I went to school in Mexico, so I became a Mexican. So, I'm a Mexican when I'm in Mexico and I'm a US citizen when I'm in the US. So it's, that's a, I call myself a border phenomenon now. And when I came, when I came back, I would hear stuff in the, this is like a Montebello junior high, man. And, and you know, everything from like Pancho Villa was a band and I go, you know, I, he's a national hero, man. You know, I, I don't think, uh, I think you're wrong. If they wouldn't let us speak Spanish in, at Montebello Junior High in the middle of East LA. Mm. And, I, and I remember uh, there was these two guys from TJ that came over and they, they didn't speak any English at all. They wanted to know where the, the Reese's snack bar was at. And so I, I told them, hey, you know, I, I'll, uh, I spoke Spanish to them. I said, no, I'll, take you, I'll take you to the snack bar. It's called the Sugar Shack, and uh, one of the teachers, one of my teachers, says, "Hey, I can't, can't speak Spanish," and uh, I actually hit that guy. I, I, I whacked him on the jaw, and in oh. the, in the, in the I, I'm not a vi kind of a violent person, but that really ticked me off. It and they took me to the principal's office, Mr. Perry. I, I remember really cool, really cool principal, and I. I explained to him what was going on. I said, these guys, two guys, they, they didn't know any, nobody was showing them where, how to get, get around. They were just dumped in the school and they didn't even know where to, how to get to their classrooms or anything. And uh, I explained it to him and then they, he let me go I, back to class. I thought I was going to get expelled. The funny thing, I never saw that teacher again either. So I don't know if they, you know, fired them or what they did, but uh, but what I'm saying is that this attitude of uh, defending Mexico uh, and but you know East LA was kind of like you know was kind of like a Mexico to me. It was pretty pretty outrageously a, a majority of people living in East LA were Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it sounds like what was happening with the culture. Um, of, uh, you know, the family, the inner family culture, what was happening at an early age, and then all of a sudden being removed into Mexico and having a new culture, and then coming back and having to reestablish yourself. There's so many things going on to create you who you've become. Uh, do you feel like you had, I don't want to call it political, but do you feel like you were forming a stance 
around that time? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I, you know, they did a TEDx on me uh, last year. And as I, they were asking me a whole bunch of questions, uh, it, it seemed like living at the border or being this border phenomenon influences me in, in, in a lot of different areas, you know, including my art. Because I, I remember I always liked to draw and stuff, but uh, when I started working on issues, I remember the college professors saying, "Oh, you should be like more universal. Don't 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 paint with the with the Chicano issue because that's like limiting my my aesthetic uh, audience." And I'm going well. But that's the audience that I want to focus on, you know. And uh, so I was like kind of clashing all the time. I think um, the, you know, I mean, this is like the 60s too, you know, where the human rights um, stuff was going on. It was like, every, you know, everybody was struggling to, against the war, women, uh, blacks, uh, you know, it was like all of these issues um, were going on. So, um, to me, it felt right to do um, stuff that said something, you know, about what was going on in society. What was Barry O'Logan like before the fight uh, for Ch Chicano Park? You know, um, it's interesting because uh, Barrio Logan was uh, like the first big barrio. I think San Diego County had about 55 different barrios, uh, Mexican barrios in San Diego County. It's a pretty big county. We also have 19 Indian reservations, more Indian reservations than any other county in the United States. Mm. Plus, we're right next to the most transited border in the world, Tijuana, San Diego. So Barrio Logan was, was really developing. And I think, it, you know, the streets, we had two theaters in Spanish, Spanish theater, we had tortillerias, we could get our uh, pan dulce, sweet bread. We even had lawyers that did immigration stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the community was, was really blossoming. And, um, you know, um, and it, it was really strong. And I think that in a certain way, it, it made us strong enough to battle for Chicano Park because when, when, when the city decided to put the freeway interstate five right through the middle of the commercial area and the residential area, taking like 5,000 families just out of the, out of our neighborhood, that neighborhood, because it went all the way down to the border uh, and other neighborhoods coming up national city, Chula Vista and that, um, people were really getting, you know, upset in it. And when they strangle you off, I used to call it the, the Simpson, uh, you know, knifing, because it, it, to me is like putting, you know, cutting off the neck of the neighborhood. And then that they reclassified that neighborhood in the, into dirty industry and they put junkyards and all this dirty industry mm -hmm. in right where we, we had our, our downtown, our downtown area. And then they build up in the 67, 68, they start building the bridge and they opened up the whole section between the freeway and the bay to go to Coronado, taking another 500 families out. That was a final blow. And when it was way back in the day when it was a white neighborhood, they were always gonna do a park somewhere in the neighborhood. But uh, once it became Mexican uh, after World War II, uh, they never, they never even talked about it. But we, the community was still struggling, going to meetings, talking about make, doing, uh, getting a park in the community. And uh, of course, the city fathers would never, would it never bring, bring that up. But I think the generation of the Chicanos uh, in the '60s, really, you know, I, I would go to city council all the time and 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 be go to all these meetings and with some of the seniors, citizens uh, from the community and keep on pushing to get a park. And then when we found out that they were gonna make a highway patrol station parking lot underneath the bridge, that's when we said, yay, 
we ain't, got, we ain't having that because police brutality, even though it seems fashionable right now, uh, was pretty rampant in, in the 60s. They, they were beating up Mexicans and blacks, like, you know, shooting them in the back. It, the same, you know, same thing, you know. So a lot of the, our issues as Chicanos from the 60s are still, we're still dealing with them. Where were you at at the time that the park was starting to be developed? Well, I was uh, in, in 1970, I was, uh, was working, I was the director of the Centro Cultural de la Raza our, our, in, in Baboa Park, but I was going to San Diego State. I was a student also. And uh, I remember when I saw the blue, the Gestetner flyer that they used to print stuff in those years. They said that all oh, they're they're doing a parking lot underneath the bridge there. We we zoomed down from from San Diego State over to the park. There was already you know I remember at least two to three hundred people, mostly kids and and mothers, doing like these human chains around the bulldozers. They stopped the construction. So we, with the U.S. University students, we just melted into the to the community and um, started picketing and boycotting the the whole the whole uh, construction. Right. Where where were you living at the time that this happened? I think it was east. Oh yeah, it was east uh, East San Diego over in 30, 38th Street and University, <laughs> trying to get a cheap cheap apartment and as a student, you know, trying to afford afford life, going to be to school and, and working and, and all that, you know, so it's. When did you first meet Ramon Chunky Sanchez? Um, uh, Chunky was, uh, he actually was a student also. He came from Brawley, from, from, the, from the Valley and uh, he came up to San Diego State and uh, it was funny because uh, as big as that dude was, uh, he was a PE student. He he was he was actually studying physical education, and and it was it was interesting because he they because he was so big. I don't know if you if you remember what he looked like, but he was like huge, short, but but really wide. And they used to play football down there in Raleigh, and so he was really good. He, he, they used to like to smash the white boys heads over there in Broadway. I always I always heard uh, all kinds of weird story. But uh they they were bad really good uh, football players. Him him and his brother is also real big. And so that's the first time that I met him and he would you know he would be uh playing music there at San Diego State and then of course I was the director of the central I I I got him to be part of the multidisciplinary uh, artist group that uh, was working out of the cultural center. Because the cultural center, we were dealing with all the arts, you know, the poets, like Alurista, the musicians, uh, dancers, you know, visual artists, uh, you know, the whole gamut of, of arts. And I think that that was really important for me, for my development to, to be associated with we're not just painters and artists, but all the musicians and, and that. And they started a big rondalla, <clears throat> Chunky and some of the other musicians um, at the university. And they used to perform uh, with Cesar Chavez during the boycotts and, and all that with Cesar Chavez. So everything just, you know, I, I would paint a mural by Cesar Chavez, they would be jamming. So it, we all were working on on the similar issues, you know. Central Cultural de la Raza, what was your role contribution to establishing, uh, develop, developing the center? We were meeting as artists, like in people's homes and stuff, but mm -hmm. here we have the Balboa Park with all the museums, but we never had anything about Mexico because of the, the museums, they all look like colonial Spanish architecture and they never, they never had anything to say anything about, about Mexico or even the indigenous peoples here. You know, like I was saying, we got 19 Indian reservations. Even the so-called Museum of Man, 
they would always do, uh, uh, you know, rocks and, and arrowheads and stuff like that. And it was always so, so limiting. So uh, we figured that we needed some place in Balboa Park, like where all the museums were at that represented us. So we took over a building that is now the Aerospace Museum. We took it over and oh, we wow. also, they, they also took, the same time we took over the park, we took over the Centro Cultural and uh, the cops came over and we chained ourselves in there and uh, we didn't get out till, um, you know, till the struggle. They arrested some of us and then uh, Finally, uh, they said, well, we'll give you another building in Bubble Park. And uh, I think they, they gave us um, $20,000 to improve the building. The building is around the water tank that they used to use for, for housing uh, ripped off bicycles. So it was like bicycle frames and dust and stuff. That was a, our cultural center. So they, they cleaned it out. They opened up some doors. They put some heaters in there and some lights. And that was our, it took them to July of 1971 for us to open up in there, to get in there and start our cultural center. Um, we had like a basketball floor, an old basketball floor that some gym that was, that broke down um, gave us that flooring and that was our our dance floor um so i was uh you know one of those initial founding artists from the get-go and um, it actually became um, one of the first directors there um through a CETA grant that was happening at that time uh, through sacramento and um, we actually the central was the one that funded the first murals at Chicano Park too. So, we, you know, I allocated some funds to buy some paint. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So, it, you know, things like seem like they, they, they connect all the time. We used the, the inside duality mural uh, that was kind of headed by Guillermo Aranda. Most of us, they were painters. Uh, pitched into to that mural and we never been on a scaffolding before or used you know never painted I, I actually never painted a mural before that one I, I used to paint large canvases because the teachers like me they used to give me some of their their you know leftover canvases that previous students left there to they, they knew that I didn't have any money so they would turned me out to big canvases and um, and they they noticed that I could paint big I can I can paint little things little detailed things and then I can I can use a big four inch brush and and, and paint uh, large so my dimension wise I, I I'm an automatic uh, mural painter I just it uh, it never affect me. In what country did you paint your favorite mural? The guy that, that really got Mandela out of South Africa, you know, Stephen Biko. And it was Stephen Biko's 20th anniversary of his death that we painted a mural on Falls Road in, in Northern Ireland, you know. Yeah, that's Falls Road. And in fact, the English march there in front of that mural, uh, dressed up in as red Ku Klux Klaners. It's really kind of weirdo to see those guys uh, still marching around like Klaners. And uh, they really, and by the way, I, I did Biko and the bottom, their wild style, because they, they knew that I was doing stuff with graffiti artists and they wanted me to do uh, a graffiti type of, um, lettering and I and I really went wild when I first drew it and nobody could read it of course and so uh, they they told me to mellow off and uh, so that it could still be read so I kind of it's kind of 
between WOW style and, and readable, readable lettering. And I put Mandela's profile there at the bottom, bottom right, and you can see his profile. Right. And, uh, and Stephen Biko is a guy in the middle there. And that, this was done at his 20th anniversary of his death. And, um, and they, they got me to, to become the coordinator of this mural. I coordinated not only the IRA uh, muralists from, from there, but also ETA. ETA are the subversive North Basque of Spain. They, they send a group of artists. Then I had another group from Leonard Peltier group of, uh, from the United States that came over. And then I had family, granddaughters and grandsons of people that have, have died in the prisons there in, uh, in Ireland also painting. So it was a really cool group to work with. And uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, they love Che Guevara. Che Guevara's his full name is Che Guevara Lynch. He was his father was Irish, and they are very proud that they exported the revolution to the to the Americas. And so when they saw a Chicano up there, they, they kept on. Well, I'm the closest thing to Che Guevara <laughs> that they've seen in a while. So it was uh, really really cool. Um, the Jerry Adams, the president of uh, Shane Fein, was went to visit us like nine, eight, nine times. And uh, the Mexican consulate from Dublin was there. They couldn't figure out how is a homeboy from Tijuana, San Diego, leading up a mural in Belfast. So I, I, uh, I've been painting around the world. Uh, it's been kind of like one of my, one of my, uh, if I'm going to go to, Barcelona, I'll, I don't just go as a tourist. I go to, to work on something. And it, to me, it's much more fun to, to, to do a project, you know, paint a mural, uh, work with a group of people, uh, get a sense of that community and include the dynamics of, of including that particular community into the mural that I'm working on. It's, uh, seems more fulfilling to me. You know, I've done it in China, Japan, um, in uh, France and, and Spain, Cuba. I've been, I've done seven, seven murals in Cuba and Havana uh, for the past 20 years. Which one of those murals would you say would have had the greatest impact on the community where it was painted worldwide? Well, that's why I threw that Belfast mural because, uh, there's like a regular uh, summer international festival in front of that mural and people come from all over the place and they have a parade and that's where they put me as a judge of the parade too. And I was, when I saw 300 uh, IRA guys with, with uh, fatigues and, and black uh, military boots and, and wife beaters with a big tattoo of Che Guevara on their shoulder marching down, I said, these guys, you know, it, it was funny because I said, man, they, I actually called them white Mexicans because they, they, there were so many, so many parallels between the, the Irish and, and Mexicans. I mean, I mean, a lot of people say, well, they like to drink, but, but, you know, the way they are, I mean, they're, they're also Catholic, right? Like a lot, a lot of Mexican people are Catholic, but, um, their attitude, their uh, revolutionary attitude, and uh, you know they they stand for who they are. I I always you know it, they're nothing like the English. They were like really uh, more human than the English. The English just wanted to seem like they 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 kept on wanting to impose their way their way of life and their superiority on everybody. Well, I don't know if I, I, you know, we we talked about it before the, it, earlier, but I'm working on a new mural with the IRA muralist 
on the San Patricios Battalion. The San mm -hmm. Patricios were the Irish. They, when they went, they were in the U.S. military. When they got to Tamaulipas, to the border, they saw the church. They saw the music. They heard the singing. They felt more closer to Mexico than the United States. So 500 of the Irish jumped over to the border and, and fought on the side of Mexico. And they, they, they went all the way to Chapultepec where, where they, they, got, uh, they got hung. They, they, some of the last ones that got caught got hung over there in, in Mexico City. So uh, it's a big history of how much influence we have of our heritage in Mexico with, with the Irish. So um, I'm working with uh, the major historian on, on the San Patricio's uh, history. I'm working with the pub, uh, Thorn Brewery here in San Diego, because I want to do a parade. Because, you know, Mexican people, as well as Irish people, they don't know, they don't know these, these parts of history. They don't teach you this stuff in, in, uh, in U.S. schools, you know. They teach, they, they teach some of that in Mexico, and they actually have a big uh, celebrations in Mexico City and Guadalajara on the San Patricios, but not in the United States. So this is an attempt to, to do a mural that has some historical significance for both of our community. You know, why do you think schools aren't teaching um, the population, you know, about you know, their heritage, specifically, you know, how this was all developed. Um, why do you think the curriculum doesn't stand uh, to support that? Um, those who create the curriculum, are they just not knowledgeable? Um, should they be knowledgeable? Or should they bring experts such as yourself in to teach that, uh, that portion of, of our history, um, of our society, you know, and why it's important? Because, you know, there's a lot that's that's moving away from us as individuals and we're becoming more and more you know distracted and you know there's all these new things that are happening in the world and the more new things that happen in the world the you know the more possibility that people forget uh these specific details about their their own neighborhoods right and um you know, so I wanted to see if you can hit on that real quick and yeah, you know, what... you know, it's interesting. They 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 even try to take art out of out of the curriculum. And mm -hmm. and one of the things that I know about art is I was a very introverted kid when I was a kid, but the more art that I did, I became a stronger individual. Now I'm such a hard headed dude, it's like you know, you can't shut me up. And so to me, you know, to try, try to even teach art in school that, you know, and I'm talking about everything, you know, music, uh, theater, you know, all, all, of, all of the arts, that becomes a stronger individual. So what, what my, I strive for is to empower the student with more knowledge, not only of himself, but of his culture. And I want people to to be proud of who they are, you know? And the thing is that once you're proud of, and you know that, because I, I know I'm part Yaqui and German, and on my, on my dad's side, I'm Zapoteca and French on my mom's side. I know who, where I come from, and I'm proud of that, you know? And because they would always talk about the European parts when I was a kid. And now that I know these other factors, I call myself bread pudding because I'm, I'm such a capirotada of things. It, when, once people know who they are, they're, hard, they're stronger, they're harder to control. And I, I think, you know, I, for a long time, I, I think that, that the reason they don't teach us uh, our own history, you know, here we are in the, in the most transited border in the world. They don't teach us, they, they, they won't even teach us bilingual education. Why, why is that? Every country that I've been to, even, even in, in, in Spain, everybody spoke Italian on one side, they spoke French on the other side, or two yep. to the other. Belgium and Brussels, they spoke five to seven languages, everybody. 
What the hell is, you know, here we are at the border. They, they, they act like if you have like a Spanish accent, you're, what are you? you? You must be ignorant or you must be gangster oriented or, or something negative, mm -hmm. you know. But if you have a French accent, a German accent, you must be an intellectual. But it's Spanish, all of a sudden it's like, you know, the, the, it's like an oppressive thing. So mm -hmm. it, why isn't it, you know, they even, had, they used to have Cesar Chavez in the high school social studies book. They, they even took him up. You know, they used to at least have that, but there's no other, you know, historical figure about, you know, even the ones that are from San Diego or from California or from the United States, that they don't, they don't mention them. It's like we're, we're an invisible minority majority and I think you know like I'm into archiving uh, I they don't say you know any of our history is anywhere you know in any museum you know and so I I've been working on the archives in Santa Barbara and anybody wants to go to Calisphere in the University of Santa Barbara Multicultural Library you'll see Victor Ochoa and you'll see you know 54 uh, legal size uh, file folder drawers and images and, and as much stuff as I can put in there um, saved up because my grandfather was an archivist and he said those Yankees, he used to call the U.S. people Yankees. He was from the 30s here and, and he said those Yankees, they don't, they don't care about us. They ain't going to do anything for us you got to do it yourself, you know, so mm -hmm. that, that was the attitude that I grew up with, and why don't they do that, you know, I, I work with curriculum writers, and they even, they, oh yeah, that you're, you have a very rich history and culture, but they don't, you know, they want to make you think that if you make tortillas, you're, you're, you're ignorant, you know, mm -hmm. we call ourselves Toltecas and Aslan, the Toltecs said that all these things that we're creating, you know, even tortillas was an art form and that, that uh, it was part of life and it was an important thing. So why is it that they don't do it? They've been doing, they've been trying to sterilize us out, out, of, out of U.S. history left and right from the beginning. They, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the fact is that this was Mexico not that long ago, you know, the first governors of, of California were Mexican and African, and, and what the hell, you know, we're, we're, we're not even in there. And Tell him, I, <laughs> I, I, I try to find Logan Heights the other day in the photo museum. There was one colonial house from Logan Heights in, the, in their archives. I go, damn, and it's like, mm. you know, if we don't do it, we have finally got a museum, Luis, uh, they develop it right next to the park, and we're going to be... Uh, trying to save as much of our stuff as possible. And then we're going to, we're online. You can go Chicano Park 51 on YouTube. And we're putting in uh, information on there just on our 51st anniversary of the park. So, you know, we're, we just got to keep on doing the mural. The murals act as open books, open archives, you know, um, you know, to, to keep that up. And we're using the paints that have a 50 year durability on there. And uh, it's all in the effort to, to get, you know, to get our history out and not, not to forget, um, you know, even the basic things, you know, some important people or heroes or, or, or whatever. We, we need to feel proud of who we are. What is your contribution to mural restoration? Well, I actually, I actually wrote a book on, on it. We, we, 12 years ago, we received uh, $1.6 million to restore the oldest murals at Chicano Park. And mm -hmm. that was a kick in the head. You know, we, we had never really got money to, to paint. You know, we always doing everything on a volunteer basis and scraping up to, to buy uh, materials. So I've been kind of a technician with uh, the murals ever since uh, 50 years ago. And uh, I went to 
to talk to chemists and paint companies to find out what uh, materials would be most durable uh, on the concrete pylons and, and the technique to clean them, to prep them, to prime them, to, to, to do all those uh, things. I, I've always been into paints. I worked at a silk screen shop. I, work, I used to work painting cars. So I, I used to know uh, or manipulate all kinds of types of paints. So um, I knew the formulas and, and stuff like that to, to, uh, to paint. So the, as far as the restoration, you know, I, I, I wrote a book. It was printed in China, um, and it, it has recommendations. And I, I thought that, that I needed to have a book that's bound like that, that is pretty uh, animal-proof, so that the future – artists would know what we used, um, you know, because people forget, people forget history, they're, they're going to forget what kind of stuff we used. Um, right. And so that when they're uh, maintaining them in the future, they'll know what to use or what not to use. Like we used to use muriatic acid to etch the bacteria out of the concrete. Nobody knew that when they put the wood forms to build a bridge, they used to put motor oil on the wood oh, yeah. to the slip, the slip to, to, to break away the, the wood from the cement. And, and we always thought when we're painting on it, how come it was oily and how come the paint wouldn't stick on there? So we, I found out there was oil. So how do you take oil off of the concrete? So little basic things like that, you know, where, you know, here we are after 51 years we still have now a national landmark, a historical uh, tre treasure, um, kind of like the, like uh, what is those that hill where the where the presidents are etched in the rock there? With oh them? yeah. Oh. Mount Rushmore. Oh no, Mount it's that's... yeah. Mount, Rush Mount Rushmore is a, a historical landmark. Wow. It's that's Black old. Mountain. As far as I'm concerned, that's Black Mountain. That's not Mount Rushmore. That's Black Mountain. Somebody defaced it. Chicano Park, is, Chicano Park is our Mount Rushmore. Nice. Okay. And so, Victor, is that book available for public purchase? You know, I, I did it like 12 years ago. We gave it to all the original artists. We gave it to several libraries. Mm. Um, and that, and uh, I think we only printed like 1500 books and okay. uh, there is some the steering committee might have a few left but it's been a long time that and we've been we've been uh, you know sending it out and i think we even sold some um i only have a few copies left because i i uh, i gave it to people that were going to use them Right. So if anybody out there is watching this and they would like to learn about the techniques that you, you have in the book, uh, how can they contact you? Um, well, I think we can, you know, we, we know we have them in certain libraries, so we could probably check them out. It's called Chicano Park Restoration Manual. Okay. And that's written by you as well? Yeah, I was written by me and then... Uh, uh, there's uh, Sal Baracas did the, the digital uh, layout, and it's about four of us that worked on it. But I'm the I'm the writer author. It looks like it's available for free on Google Books. Yeah, okay. so you can get it from Google Books, get the uh, digital copy, and then print it yourself. I've got a book here I'd like to share. Yeah, that's my kind of my workbook. And I, I put Bible, the Bible, not because I'm kind of a, a, a religious person, uh, but I thought because I was giving out Xerox copies of different issues. And then I noticed that, that the students were very disorganized and they, they couldn't find anything in their backpacks. And so I, I started... Uh, I started put, binding it together and I put in Bible, it kind of gave it a little respect. It, because a lot of people think, oh, it's just a, a Xerox copy, but 
these were articles that I think no uh, other book would cover in my uh, gamut of uh, material that that I wanted to to talk about had everything from Mexican history to to the great uh, muralist to different things from what what is Cinco de Mayo, what was graffiti, you know, because I I was uh, working with uh, James Craigoff and trying to find out what uh, the whole graffiti movement was th throughout the world. And, and uh, by the way, he just recently passed away. Um, and uh, so I included uh, some of that um, material. Um, so the book in itself has has all the things that I wanted to teach as in rep to represent uh, Chicano art and um, you know all the different issues from immigration you know to you know um, bilingual education and just to know our indigenous heritage because you know one of the big battles to to let even Mexican people know that we are indigenous because we, you know, there's there's so much racism on both sides of the border. Most Mexicans don't realize where that they're indigenous, that they're, you know, um, you know where where their families come from. If, you know, they they'll say, oh, they're from Tijuana, but that Tijuana, we have people from from Yucatan, from Chiapas, from Guerrero, from. Veracruz, we have people uh, from all over Mexico that, that live in Tijuana. So you can't say that you're, you know, you're a certain group or anything like that, or to try to find out, uh, you know, where your grandmother was born or where, what uh, tribe she was, or even what foods and things like that. You know, it's just, uh, Mexico's got such an amazing a variety of 31 states of so many things that just, you know, I, I decided way back when I was 19 to, to go to every state of Mexico because I realized that most of the books that I was reading about Mexico were written by white like historians and like anthropologists. And they always gave it a, a weird tilt to it. And I, I never really appreciated it. <laughs> So you've been teaching for a few decades on uh, Chicano history, uh, culture. It's going more like 50 years, dude. <laughs> 50 years. Wow. Okay. More than a few, uh, yeah. five decades to be exact. That's that's pretty cool, though. So you've contributed definitely a lot. Um, this comes from your background and what we talked about earlier in your stance. Well, the uh, thing so was, it, it was really important that, that we we teach the next generation that you know things and and uh, you know as you as you can tell you know the different generations that happened in the past 50 years some of them just completely forgot uh any community responsibility at all mm -hmm. you know we had the me generation then we had the decade of the hispanic which those terms again kind of like deny your indigenous heritage and so my uh, generation of Chicanos, we wanted to tie more into our roots. And um, so it, that we changed our flag. We had a mestizo flag that had like three faces. And then eventually we, did, we quit using that. We, we realized that we were more indigenous than Spanish, you know, so. Mm. That's interesting. You know, a lot of people do not. When you say what language do you speak, you say Spanish. So it's that's, it's that's, an, oppre that's an oppressor's language, just like English. So uh, that's why we you see a lot of my murals, and I I change the lettering like barrio. I I spent I I spell it with a with a wrong v, mm. and it's not because I don't know how to spell. It's because the, the lack of respect of even Spanish, it, the Spanish is just, you know, a, some another European to try to come and take over America. Did you create any other books? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, okay. I, everything from, from about, I think it was something like 75 to 100 um, bilingual, bicultural uh, books for, 
when uh, when the government did the Title VII, which was uh, to put implement bilingual education in schools. I worked with a, a group of curriculum writers in, to develop uh, from preschool books to high school, mm. you know, books. In fact, I remember interviewing a bunch of high school kids back in the day. And I said, well, what kind of books do you guys like? They said, well, we don't, because they, they wanted to be cool. You know, they wanted to walk, you know, you know, slipping and sliding. They said, we don't want no big old heavy books. You know, we want like, we like these paperback books and that they could slide in their back pocket and stuff. So I started designing small portable, portable books, but with a lot of drawings in them. I, I, I used to put a lot of uh, cartoons and uh, illustrations into it um, and try to try to get them to, to, uh, to to read them, you know, because you know, even after when I was at the Mac, I I rarely saw the kids reading. It was really, really bad. I actually taught a class called Gangs, and I did, I I always wonder why they. Why they selected me to teach a class? I'm not a sociologist, mm. but I, I said, "Well, why why'd you guys pick me to to teach this class?" And they had a really boring book, sociolog sociological book, really terrible. And uh, he says, "Oh, because you look like a homeboy." And if I wear if I put a home, a hat on and stuff, if I wear some Ray Vans, forget it, man. It's like. Hey. <laughs> And I mean, I can I can speak not only 40s Calo Pachuco slang, but I can also talk like uh, contemporary Cholo style because I've been painting murals on the streets. You know, I mean, I you know, it's not that I'm uh, I'm gang related, just that I'm I'm community oriented. You know, so, right. so they they hired me. I went, man, I brought the Crips, the Bloods. The, Motorcycle clubs, the Ku Klux Klan, the Moonies, the all these different, you know, not only black and Mexican gangs, but I also brought in white gangs, those those uh, those knuckleheads that committed suicide with the black Nikes. Oh, you're talking about the the something gate, Heaven's Gate or whatever. Or? Heaven's Gate, man. I invited those guys to talk about their their wow. Gang. You got cold up in there and everything. That's mm -hmm. great. No, you know, How about the hell? Did you bring I, I, the Hell's I, Angels up in there too, man? <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I asked the cops to bring their gang details. You know, the yeah. the Asian gang detail was two white dudes, and and so they were the experts, and and they they had all these La Ocean monk photos that they showed us, and then they had them first as monks, and then as as gangsters with chrome. Chrome shotguns and all this stuff. It, mm -hmm. it was it, it was interesting to see where the expertise was. How many of us are in prison? So we had a, a I invited the, some of the prison guys to talk about the gangs in the prisons. Even those Victory Outreach. Shit, mm -hmm. I, I went to Victory Outreach. They they try to give me little cups of of this red liquid like. Uh, what was that down in South America? The Kool-Aid? Jim Jones? Jim Jones. They, they <laughs> just, it was just like Jim Jones in there, man. I go, no, thank you, man. I ain't going to do no, no little red juice out of a little cup. I just had a question um, regarding um, philosophy. I didn't know if, Mr. Ochoa, you uh, dive into philosophy a whole lot. Got to. Um, but the idea is, and I know you said you weren't re religious, but I'm sure there's a spiritual sense there. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm kind of wondering, what do you, with all the things that have ever happened to our civilization as human beings here, the, the progression that we've gone through um, and to get to where we're at today, um, it, it seems to me, and this is just my opinion, um, 
maybe you could you could speak on it for your own self, but it seems to me that we're always um, suffering, we're always fighting um, for something, right? Whether it's because of pride or because it's, it's because of resources, you know, whatever the case is. Um, why do you think we have to go through all this within life, and what do you think our purpose is here? And I, I mean, I, you found your purpose, but everybody doesn't have the same purpose right but overall general in a general sense what do you think our our purpose is here you know it's i'm i'm 72 now um luis and uh, as i'm looking at your hat there uh, you know um i sort of feel like uh, marley when he says one one love and in uh, of course you know I, it's not that i'm closer to death but I've been to Mitlan, which is the place where it's the entrance to the underworld. And this recent mural that I did is, is the killing of Anastasio. And I'm using all pearlescent paints and, and we're talking about death and we're talking about the transition between life and death. And so if you see that Anastasio mural, you're gonna see that he's like in an eclipse and like there's these orbs going up and it actually feels, when you go to the site, it actually feels like you're in a church with, where it's a, like the, you know, the, the altar of a, of a church. We also been doing, as Chicanos, we've been doing uh, Day of the Dead for 50 years, more or less. And, and it's different with us. We don't just do the, the European version of Day of the Dead, and, and we're not only Catholic or Christian, but we also include a hybrid of the ways the Aztecs and the pre-Columbian people also worship death. And it's, 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 it's a lot different. We don't have hell, for instance. A lot of people go, oh, the underworld, is that where hell is at? No, it's just closer to Mother Earth, and we return to, to the Earth, and and uh, the different elements of water and, and uh, fire and uh, all of those elements are part of that. In fact, the motifs and things around the mural are stuff that I that I saw at in Mitlan. And uh, I think that uh, you know to try to paint spirituality. It's kind of an interesting thing because I think you do feel you do feel that when you're there, and it, it has an iridescent metallic uh, thing to it, almost like the Hindus use a lot of pearl and gold in that. Um, I think that you know there's a lot of reasons why we're we're the we're in a situation like that. There's all this oppression. There's oppression against women. There's a, a racist oppression. There's property oppression. There's consumerism oppression. You know, you know, it's pretty complex. It's not just like, you know, um, one faceted. And I, I think, you know, this border shit that goes on, what is that about? This is the earth, you know. You know, it's like if you could see a teepee with a chain link fence around it, you, you'll never see a teepee with a chain link fence around it. Because why? Because they, you know, we all are part of Mother Earth and Mother Earth, it belongs to everybody. So there's like these different attitudes. And I think, I think it's, it's pri primarily an oppressive forces that are always trying to put down other other people, other races, other genders, you know. Um, so to me, to be part of a struggle, you know, it's just pretty normal, you know, and, and I don't see it ending very soon. You know, I don't see, you know, I was telling some, some black activists the other day, it used to be where, because I, I worked with the Panthers for three or four years uh, in the mid seventies and uh, we used to do Chicanos and, and Blacks used to do more stuff together. And I, in this guy, this active, Black activist says, hey, you know that immigration is a Mexican issue. 
I said, buddy, brother, we <laughs> we got to work together on this stuff because it, they, you know, they, you know, it it belongs to all of us. You know, we we got to struggle about these things together, and um, you know, now we got Asians Asians getting the a brunt of a lot of shit, and a lot of them thought they were almost white. I I remember hearing that for a while. You know? <laughs> Mm. With now with Trump, man, everything you know, it's like <laughs> you're Asian, you ain't white, man. You're gonna get some shit too. It just kind of seems as though that this will never end. Like this will always be the the thing that will happen on Earth, and people are put here to go through a struggle um, for whatever reason. And you know, we all can find our own reasons within it, but um, it almost seems like it'll never end because it's been happening since Egyptian times. From what we understand, yeah, yeah, the beginning. Yeah, well, the you Bible. Who we you know, are. A lot of people think that, you know, people people tell me a lot. Oh, art shouldn't be political, and I'm going. Well, the Bible is political, well, you know. Um, and you know, I haven't really read the Bible that much. I my grandfather uh, used to let me do uh, illustrated version of the Bible. But in, in there, you know, there's like, you know, there's geometry, you know, ge um, geographic section, you know, the Jews and the, and the you know, the Palestinians, uh, you know, there, there's like a question of if Jesus was dark or did he have kinky hair or you know, there's all this racism going on in, in that, you know, so I, I, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, uh, it could be that um, it'll never end, you know, maybe, maybe somebody told me that till we get attacked by extraterrestrials, we'll get to, we'll, we'll get together and unify against those guys and then quit. Yeah quit fighting each other but um yeah you know i mean i already feel like i'm an extraterrestrial mm. and, uh, <laughs> but you know what do things, i man <laughs> I, I think that, that you one finds as you get stronger one finds a place in your in yourself in your life that is peace and unity you know even though you're struggling you can still find it within yourself uh, i think uh and love has something to do. I think love is is something that uh, unifies us. You know, I, I I came up with this visualization. I'm actually taking a nap, and and I I have a portrait of my dad on the wall, and then my son. I woke up and my son was in front of it, and I saw something where I could connect through through the eyes of my son to my father, like a a generational thing and it was like I saw that I could connect to the future and I could also connect to the past and now this is here gagging on my babas watching <laughs> watching t falling asleep in a boring tv program and and uh and I come up with it and I, I go what is that that um is is uh connecting me to my father and it's love man it's like he loved me like uh i'm like it, i'm his only son and uh and i see even, even though he died a long time ago i, I still uh, i still feel that and sometimes when you look back in history because i i look back at uh pre-columbian people even cave people what why am i connecting to the past if it isn't also for that same reason you know so i i, I see that's kind of like the energy that people may call it spiritual or religious or whatever whatever the term is but um, your hat is pretty pretty heavy duty even even though it's in old english <laughs> <laughs> i'm just yeah kidding. yeah no yeah no i appreciate that man and uh thank you for um you know, putting some, some of your, you know, human emotion into it, because you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about certain things like that. And, and I know you being an artist and being the person you are, 
I know I can get an honest answer from you. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I try to be I try to be honest. And when I I brought together my team to work on this Anastasio mural, I introduced them to the the widow and have her talk to some of my students, airbrush airbrush students. If I had a gross month, and um, they were they left with tears in their eyes. And that's when I when I when I said, man, this is this is going to be a good team because they there's already the spiritual uh, energy that's already going back and forth. And I said, man, this is going to be a, a great a great team because uh, if you don't have that kind of dynamics where people are really vested into it in their their hearts, you know, it's uh, it's harder for them. I I think you know, like a musician. You know, um, you know how they always say, if you don't put your heart into it, you know, the 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 song is <laughs> isn't going to come out good. I mean, it's not. The more you, you know, you're going to record it with all the technology. You still, you know, if you don't have your soul and your heart into it, it's not. It not. It doesn't come out. And so I don't. I don't do artwork anymore without really connecting that way. And when I'm drawing or painting. I'm like in the spiritual, I'm almost like I'm at church or something when I'm painting. It's like I'm on another, I don't even get tired. It's weird. It's like mm. I keep on painting for hours and don't even get tired. That's that energy. Yeah, we, you know, we definitely have to open up more, you know, towards each other, you know, enough with the, you know, machismo, badassery mentality, you know, get rid of that ego um, and bring more love into the equation. Right on me. I noticed one one thing that, that I love about everything that you've said, Victor, and and all the stories that I've heard, uh, everything that you do, you do it for the future. You're doing things to, to help bring the the future uh, along, you know, to, to, to give them something. Uh, what what would you like to say, even though this is this show just happens to be all men? So I don't want to just direct this question towards the men. So I'll direct it towards the women too. What message would you have to, to leave to any youth that may watch this show uh, as far as your journey here on earth? What message would you like to leave on, on that note? Well, that, that's a, a hell of a question. I think um, since, since the beginning of the, you know, it was funny that Painting murals made me into a teacher because the first murals that I painted, I started bringing the kids and the parents and everybody together. I said, well, what do you got? And, and it, it, it was like a classroom setting. We had tables and chairs and a blackboard. We still had chalk in those years. And I said, well, what do you guys want to put in there, you know, uh, in, the, in the mural? And I remember this little girl, he says, well, my abuelita, my abuelita was here since uh, some years before. And she was, you know, I like to put my grandmother on, on the mirror. I said, oh, great. You know, um, okay, we'll bring a picture of her tomorrow and we'll try to put it in the, in the composition. And uh, so all of a sudden it was a, a classroom. And then this kind of fear that, that we needed to have the responsibility to teach the next generation uh, all the stuff that we were learning. It's always been so important. So I, I all of a sudden, I'm a teacher. I'm, I, I'm doing every place that I go in, in other wor parts of the world. It's like a, it's like a teaching dynamics, you know. I'm throwing PowerPoints. I'm getting feedback from students and, and input. Everybody, it's like you know now. Now in the curriculum, it's what do they call it? Uh, team projects. There's they got all kinds of weird names for for things. But we, I've been doing that all all along. Ever since I've been painting, it's always been a team project where everybody's working, and young and old, and and that and um, yeah, it's very important. Our, why am I saving? Art, because I even save my Facebook graphs. I print them. I print the whole year 
of 650 photos, you know, cost me 75 bucks. I always had a photo album. Why, why do you have a photo album? <laughs> you know, it, it's, you know, now everybody saves it on their phone and then they, they drop their phone in the toilet and then there, there goes their whole family, family history. You know, yep. I'm in archives. I try to back up. I have uh, removable hard drives. I got uh, archives. I got oral history. I'm in the oral history museum. It it's all it's all about not in for whoever wants to get into it. And it's like they, they have an accessibility. It's really important to me. Do you want to uh, close with anything, Victor? Something that you um, have coming up? Anything you want to promote? Anything you want to talk about for connection? Um, a website to go to? Anything at all? Well, I mentioned I mentioned the Chicano Park uh, Fifty One, and we're uh, we're doing a, a documentary, a five episode documentary on uh, Anastasia. It, it turned into five episodes because. The women want to express themselves, so there's going to be one one episode on women. There's going to be something about Day of the Dead. I, I gave you a, a altar piece that has uh, the traditional Chicano way of looking at at Day of the Dead altars and uh, the whole ceremony of of uh, Day of the Dead is is part of Anastasio. Um, and the community, how it's influenced the community in general, because people, if they have a green card, they think that immigration isn't, isn't their issue anymore. Mm. And, and it's kind of like we need to re remind people that it's still going on. That people are still getting raped at the border. Kids are still dying in cages. It's still, it's still going on. So there's a five episode thing coming up pretty soon. Okay. We'll definitely look at how do we, uh, Come across that is it on it'll probably be on youtube right away on the on that like i said it, right now we're calling it chicano park 51 mm, but okay. um, and it already has like uh kumiai bird songs it has you know like like when we do our anniversary we we cover certain things we even have uh, bands musical bands i think we have quetzal is jamming on one video uh, you know, the dancers, the Aztec dancers. Uh, so it, it covers our event, our, our anniversary event, but at the same time, now it's, now it's in video. What I try to do is put my artwork into Instagram. Yeah. And I'm murals, plural, Ochoa. Murals Ochoa is my Instagram. And, and other than my grandson, I think my artwork is, is pre predominant in that. Instagram. So if anybody wants to see, because I do watercolors and silk screens and different different other techniques, you know. Thank you so much for uh, your time on Open Game Show. It's been incredible speaking with you. Right, right. Well, thank you guys very much for this. Uh, thank you, Henry. Yes, sir. Okay, you guys. Talk talk to you guys later. Yes, sir. Take care. Thank Have you so much. Day. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Uh,